Sweetheart, you don't need to be here, okay? You go.
Hi, Terry. What's it? Hello, everyone. How? Hi. Welcome. We've got some international speakers here. Um, we're we're going to wait a couple more minutes because I think we've got a few more logins coming. Um, and I'd like to give them time. So if you'd like to unmute yourself, that's great. We have someone logged in as MacBook. Or did that change, oh. Mike? I, I think that might have been me, Terry. No, we see Howard Massey at the bottom. Yep. I, I, I was trying to log in on my desktop and it wouldn't work. I think that was MacBook. Okay. Well, I'm glad uh, that you could join us, Howard. You you must be in night owl because it's what, one o'clock? Uh, no, one it's o uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. Oh, oh I keep getting really? confused. Quite, I keep quite, thinking you Quite UK a civilized can... time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Hi, Gary. Hi, Elaine. Elaine, I see her here. There she is. Good. Sigrid, I'm glad you made it today. Ken, nice to see you. Jan Hi. and Barry. Jan sitting Jan. over here. I'm over here. Oh, uh, yes, you've got your arm. Yes, and your glasses. Uh, we're just getting a few more people in. Uh, Nelia, Kathleen, if you want to add, and Diane, if you want to add your video we can see who you are but if you don't want to be recorded you turn off your your video uh, I'm, I'm i'm here i i guess i'm not visible but i'm here <laughs> we, well, we see you well we see your name but we don't see you <laughs> so that's okay no, no. Well, my camera is working so i don't know what the problem is but okay perfect well good good can you see me now Nope. No, no, that's, that's okay. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. I'm just going to come out as share. Um, we had a lovely little musical interlude there. That was uh, our speaker for tonight. I just thought, you know, it puts every. Oh, Gary, where's mine? <laughs> uh, it's coming shortly. It's coming shortly. <laughs> That's, that's a big tease. I'm holding off until afterwards. I can't come on, on screen sloshy. Okay. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so I think we're going to, we'll let people in as they come. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. And uh, just a couple of quick announcements. The management team has been very busy trying to pull some things together. We What we're up to right now is... Um, We've been meeting, trying to put a foundation in for the club and uh, putting some, we've started work on our roles and responsibilities and dividing up, you know, in the different jobs that need to be done. Uh, we also have uh, our treasurer and co-treasurer um, working on with the different chairs to try to pull budgets together. And that's basically all that's happening. I'm not quite sure where we want to go in terms of starting activities up because, you know, we're, we're sort of like a yo-yo, open, close, open, close with COVID. So uh, I think we're going to be low key if we can maybe think of some, if we had a closer reality to what the actual numbers were with Omicron, I, I'd have a greater comfort level even meeting outdoors. But for right now, I think um, we'll play it a little low key. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz with announcements um, for today. Uh, there was something I was going to add in there, but I forget what. Okay, Liz, do you want to take it away and share what's sure. coming up the roster? So, yeah, so I just wanted to share with you um, a few of the speakers that we have coming up. So you can maybe start to mark your calendars or, or think about, uh, yeah, I would like to see that speaker. So in Wednesday, February the 9th, we have Brad Ashton, um, a comedy writer and author who has recently retired from writing top TV comedy series. He, uh, his presentations, he, he's done numerous presentations for numerous audiences and the reports all come back that he keeps everybody highly amused with his backstage stories about famous people. 
We've asked him to concentrate more on the North American comedy writers he's worked with. So his stories are going to include uh, people like Wayne and Schuster, Jerry Lewis, uh, oh. Joan Rivers, Johnny Carson, um, com comedians along those lines. So names that we all recognize. So we're looking forward to that. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, later on in February, we have Chris Williamson. So this is more of a sports theme. And Chris is um, a very well-renowned Canadian Paralympic skiing champion. Uh, Chris only has, has had 6% of his vision since he was a very, a very young child. And he has been successful in uh, placing and winning over 100 World Cup podium finishes. So he's going to talk to us about his experiences um, during the 17 years that he competed on the Canadian Paralympic team, the Alpine team. He also is the most decorated um, Canadian Alpine Paraly Paralympic skier. I'm having a lot of difficulty with that tonight, sorry. Quite honestly, his achievements on the slopes um, representing <coughs> Canada are too numerous to mention. Then in March, we have got Jeremy Bertrand coming back. So Jeremy spoke to us back in November. He is a senior program um, advisory specialist for the Ministry of Finance. And he's gonna to return to us with a very timely presentation uh, for income tax time on maximizing your provincial income tax returns. So I'm sure that's gonna be of interest for everybody. Then in April, uh, we have for all the gardeners that we have, We've got Paul Laporte, who's going to be talking to us about building biodiversity with native plants. So Paul is very, very well known in the, um, in the sphere of native plants in Ontario. He has a nursery specializing in native woodland species and he is a consultant on ecological gardening and design. He currently is chair of the Ontario Native Plant Growers Association, and he is going to share with us the importance of native plants to our ecology and how we can incorporate them into our gardens. And then in May, we have um, Kevin Donovan. You may recognize that name because he's a quite renowned Toronto Star investigative reporter. And he is actually has a series of articles that you can follow in the Toronto Star if, if you get that paper uh, currently. So his focus has always been on journalism that exposes wrongdoings and affects change. And over the past three decades, he has reported on activities of charities, government, police, and business, among other institutions. His current focus, and I believe what he's going to talk to us about, is the Barry and Honey Sherman murders and um, mm -hmm. his work and his investigations on, on, those, on those murders. So that's what we have coming up right now. Um, there's more in the works, but they're just not quite finalized. So I can't share that with you just yet, but stay tuned. We'll have more coming. Thank and that's you. all my announcements, Jerry. Okay, thank you so much. I just also want to mention to people I forgot to, to mention is that um, we have our committee, um, or volunteer committee calling around to see if we can solicit some additional help, little bits and pieces so that we can get the club becoming a bit more active. Um, the, um, and so, so if, you, if you get a call and you've got a few minutes and you're able to help out with the club, that would be really good. I'm going to turn it over now to, um, let's see what's happening here. It's supposed to be speak of you. I'm going to turn it over to Alita Dennis. Uh, where are you, Alita? I'm Can here. You? I'm here. Yes. yes. There you go. Yes. Okay. Okay. Can you so introduce our speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Maria Sulis. Sulis. So I keep pronouncing your name wrong. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Um, Maria is a Toronto-born mezzo-soprano, and she enjoys an exciting career in both Canada and Europe. She began her European career as a principal artist with the Regensburg Opera in Germany and later performing major roles in Carmen, The Magic Flute, The Marriage of Figaro, which I was so glad to be able to see in Toronto last year, and The Barber of Seville, just to name a few. Her voice has been praised internationally by reviewers who have described it as warm and powerful, gorgeous, dusky toned, as well as full of warmth and drama with a ruby red timber. And you've heard 
heard this while you were waiting and it is her voice is absolutely amazing. As a concert singer in Europe, Maria has performed Mozart's Requiem and many Gustav Mahler's orchestral song cycles. In Canada, song repertoire in ranging from Bach's Christmas Oratorio and Handel's Messiah to Dvorak's Requiem, Mendelssohn's Elijah and Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9. As an avid recitalist, Maria has extensive song repertoire that spans the English, no. French, Spanish, and German, Greek um, languages. I, I can't imagine how she, she may just manage to, to do all of that. She can be heard on the Juno nominated CD Vivaldi Sacred Music Volume Number no. 4 with the Aradia Ensemble conducted by Kevin Malton. Malin, sorry. I'm, I'm reading a tiny little print here. Um, so um, I was introduced to Maria by my cousin Eric, who is there. I know he's there right now. Um, they were both at a mutual friend's party. And um, that took place 10 years and one week ago. Um, well, I guess 10 years and one week ago. Yes, yes. Um, yes of course. So according to Eric, he decided to leave early, and I may be wrong on this, but I think he said he had his coat on and was just heading out the door when Maria started to sing Carmen's Habanera, which you've also heard tonight. He was so intrigued that he went back to see who this beautiful, in, in, this beautiful, beautiful voice was. And my confirmed bachelor cousin took one look at Maria and was hooked and decided this was a woman he was going to marry. <laughs> so as Maria so says, timing is everything. everything. Um, and and her, the, um, it, and which was fun, funny because the, the party date had been changed so she could attend. She likes to say this was her best audition um, that she ever gave. So um, in, Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Maria. She is such a, a sweet and beautiful person, and I know you're going to really enjoy tonight's presentation. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Cousin Alita. <laughs> that was a beautiful yeah, intro. Yes. <laughs> and thank you all for joining me tonight for this talk. If I could ask a little favor, would you all mind muting yourselves? Because yeah. it does get noisy, um, yeah. some background noise. So, well, being an opera singer isn't Somebody's. Can you hear me now? Yes. So you didn't hear any of that, right? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You think I know what I'm? My doing. apologies. When we muted everyone, it it muted you too. So. Oh, because I had I muted myself. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me start again. <laughs> Um, being an opera singer isn't something I originally set out to do, and um, I did it in a usual way. So most opera singers earn a degree in voice performance, followed by opera school or a young artist program uh, with an opera company, and they're already establishing their careers by the age of 30. Whereas for me, it wasn't until I was 30 that I started seriously considering it. I took piano lessons as a child, which I loved, and I worked my way through all the Royal Conservatory exams by age 18. I did not do much singing as a child, but uh, in my teens, I joined our Greek Orthodox church choir. I sang in a trio. Um, we did Greek folk and pop music, and I sang in some small ensembles in high school. And I liked singing, so I started taking singing lessons for fun at the Royal Conservatory in my late teens. After high school, my only plan was to keep on studying music and I really liked theory, so I thought I'd try composition. And I auditioned for the University of Toronto as a pianist and was accepted into the composition department. One of our required courses was to participate in an ensemble and I chose the university singers, which 
exposed me to a whole new world of choral music. And I soon discovered that I much preferred singing to sitting at my desk trying to write music or practicing piano for hours on end. So midway through my degree, I switched my piano lessons for singing lessons. I graduated, got an office job, and uh, started looking for singing opportunities. Uh, so I sang in as many choirs as would have me. One of those choirs was the Tafel Music Chamber Choir. And we were invited by Opera Atelier to perform in their first staged productions of The Marriage of Figaro and The Magic Flute. This was my first taste of being in a fully staged opera and I loved it. And it was also the beginning of my dream to be a soloist. But uh, my teacher at the time, she said, well, your voice is pretty, but it's just too small for the stage. And uh, I have to admit she was right. All the years of choral singing uh, where I was asked to always blend and not let my voice stick out resulted in a lot of tension and it delayed my development. And I think also coming from playing the piano, I was treating my voice like an instrument rather than as a part of my body. And I was manipulating it and just kind of trying to beat it into submission to sound the way I wanted it to sound, uh, which I wanted to sound like a Baroque soprano and instead of just working with what nature had given me. So uh, around that time, one of my coaches uh, suggested I have a lesson with an Italian tenor, Angelo Marenzi. He was spending the summer in Toronto. And I thought I'd just go and have one lesson and he'd give me a few pointers and that would be it. So I went, and for those of you who know the repertoire, I sang one of Despina's arias. And uh, he said to me after, uh, yeah, you're very musical and your Italian's excellent, but you're not a soprano. You're a mezzo-soprano and there's a lot more voice in there. So I want you to come back every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and you're going to have a lesson and you're not allowed to sing without me in front of you. And we're going to open this up. And I, I was really taken aback. Uh, no one's been that enthusiastic about my singing in Toronto. And my parents were willing to foot the bill, so I went for it. And by the end of the month, I was singing uh, Dalila's aria, Mon Coeur Souffre Ta Voix, uh, with a full dark mezzo sound. Angelo was really pleased with my progress and he invited me to go to Rome in the fall and continue my studies. Uh, I was 28 at the time and I may as well have been 15 for my emotional uh, maturity. I was petrified and I was really invested in my identity as the nice, polite, sweet-voiced soprano. Um, I, I wasn't ready to be this person who makes those sounds. That was a whole different woman to who I wanted to be. Uh, Angelo just had a much grander vision of what I was capable of doing, and I, I was not there yet. So I let that opportunity pass. It did uh, boot me enough that I looked for a teacher who would be more supportive and I did find someone, but she thought I was a soprano. So I reverted back to my old repertoire and my comfort zone. My voice was slowly growing and I started singing in um, community theaters like the Scarborough GNS Society. I did uh, summer opera programs just to get experience singing roles. Um, I even was starting to get some concert gigs like messiahs here and there so I was feeling pretty good and then at the age of 30 I got a coveted position with a Canadian opera company chorus and that first contract was Carmen that's an opera with lots of fabulous choral numbers and uh, opportunities to dance and act up a storm and we were allowed to sing with our full sound and uh, <laughs> I was on stage with international opera stars and I, I just watched them and tried to learn as much as I could from them and my wonderful chorus colleagues. And that's when the opera bug really bit me. So I was always looking to better myself. I started working privately with our wonderful chorus master, Gary Wado, uh, who was very encouraging and thought I had something special to offer. But honestly, my musical impulses were so far ahead of what this could do at that time and he couldn't help me with the mechanics of singing. And uh, it's funny, about a year and some later, lo and behold, Angelo Marenzi came back <laughs> to town. Uh, 
So I thought I was going to go see him for dinner at a friend's house. And she had booked me for a lesson and I was too polite to refuse. But I did say to him, I said, look, Angelo, I'm a soprano now and I'm really happy being a soprano. I'm in the opera chorus and I'm having little concerts. So please, please don't confuse me. And he said, well, Maria, I don't care what you call yourself. You need to sort your voice out from middle C to the, the octave and the third above. So we had our lesson and I saw, yeah, I should have more lessons with Angelo. So since I wanted to be a soprano, he asked me to work on uh, Mimi, uh, Micaela, uh, Donna Elvira. And I was just killing myself. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. He didn't say peep, he just let me carry on. And after the first week, uh, he handed me a couple of cassette tapes. Uh, it was a bootleg recording of uh, him singing the title role of uh, Verdi's Otello with Dame Joan Sutherland as Desdemona and Maestro Bonin conducting. They had actually discovered Angelo and he did have a career for a while but his nerves were overwhelming so he stopped performing. So I'm listening to this. Uh, Dame Joan has passed her prime. This was from the 80s. But Angelo's voice just, he, he blew me away, just the power and the passion and the way he communicated all the emotion. And I just started thinking, okay, this man knows the Bonnings, he knows Pavarotti, he knows Domingo, he knows Tecanoa. This man thinks I have a good voice and he believes I'm a mezzo-soprano and no one in Toronto is really that excited about me. So why am I fighting him? And, uh, I went back on Monday and I said, Angelo, I think I'm ready to work as a mezzo-soprano now. And he's like, yes, now we start. So uh, I started working on uh, Orfeo's aria, Che farò senza Uridice, which was very difficult because it sits right in that part of the woman's voice. Many female singers have a problem. It's the lower, going from the chest voice to the low middle voice. And for me particularly, it was really weak. And it's probably why people thought I was a soprano because as soon as I'd sing a little higher, my voice suddenly had sound. But Angelo had the ears to, and he understood what was really going on. So by the end of my time with Angelo, I was ready to walk to Rome to have lessons with him. But he then informed me that he had been offered a three-year contract to teach at a university in Taiwan. And I was not going to go to Taiwan for lessons. So there it goes. I went back to my Toronto teacher and I said to her, look, I want to sing as a mezzo. I really feel this is right for me. Will you help me? And she agreed to work with me uh, with mezzo repertoire, but it just wasn't the same. In the meantime, I was still working with Gary Wado at the opera and he let me switch to the mezzo soprano section uh, in the chorus. And one day he said to me, this is a few months after Angelo had left. He said, uh, you know, Maria, my friend, Neil Steamer, he's a singing teacher from New York. He's in town working with the ensemble studio kids. Maybe you should have a lesson with him. I think he might be able to help you. And he was exactly what I was looking for. Uh, someone who could teach me a solid vocal technique, help me choose the right repertoire. And importantly, he believed that I had the talent to pursue a solo career. So finally, at the age of 32, I had found my passion and I started pursuing it rel relentlessly and making up for lost time. I eventually gave up my position in the chorus, much as I loved it, because I really wanted to be taken seriously as a soloist. And in this business, you're either a soloist or you're a chorister, you can't be both. Uh, another thing I did, I learned to speak Italian and German and I brushed up on my French because it was really important to me to understand what I was singing about in real time, rather than just memorizing translations. And I really believe that an audience, even if they don't speak the language you're singing to them in, they can tell if you don't know what you're singing about. So soon I was ready for my next step, auditioning for an agent. Now an agent audition or an opera house audition, they run pretty much the same way. A singer will prepare four or five contrasting arias. Uh, we choose the first one and then the audition panel will choose one or two more. I had prepared seven arias for this audition from opera and oratorio and the agent asked to hear all of them. 
and was very enthusiastic and said they'd be in touch. So I was pretty happy. And uh, after a couple of weeks of no news, I phoned them and was told that although I sang an excellent audition, I didn't have any upcoming work, so they weren't willing to represent me. And that was really upsetting because I was really looking for someone who would kickstart my career at that moment. And they were looking for proof that I was a marketable commodity before they'd represent me. And of course, I understand that now. Uh, it is a business arrangement at the end of the day, but, but that was a devastating moment for me. And uh, soon after that, I also auditioned for the Canadian Opera Company Ensemble and Opera School and was unsuccessful. It seemed that no one in Toronto would give me a chance. They knew me as a chorister or as a soprano. I, I was really surprised to see how much pushback I got from some people when I presented myself in my new repertoire. Um, I hadn't made the right contacts in my undergrad and I was kind of old, I'd been around forever. So anyway, I, you know, this, the rejection was very, very difficult. But what kept me going is my desire to connect and communicate through music, through classical music, with my voice, uh, that most unique thing that I could offer. And I just couldn't take no for an answer. So I kept working my day job and taking lessons and coaching. I started attending master classes. Uh, I went to England for several classes at the Britain Pierce School. And one summer I was at the American Institute of Musical Studies in Graz, Austria. Uh, I made friends with one of the teachers there, Roberta Cunningham. She was a soprano who had had a career in Germany and was still living there. And she kindly invited me to stay with her while I went on the German audition tour. <laughs> now, this is a rite of passage for those lucky singers who can afford to stay in Germany for weeks, uh, if not months, uh, traveling across the country and uh, auditioning in opera houses in the hopes of being offered a contract. I stayed for two months, sang for a couple of agents, but no opera houses. So. I came back to Toronto, did some tamping, got some more help from my parents, financial help. And I went back uh, for four months this time. My German was improving. I was meeting new friends from all over Europe and having unforgettable experiences, but I wasn't getting any work. I was 33 years old and I thought it was time to reassess because chasing my dream was just becoming way too expensive. I'm very grateful to my parents that they never said no to me, but still. And I was riding an emotional roller coaster. So I gave myself a deadline. I thought I have to have an agent or a contract by the age of 35, or I have to quit no matter how much it breaks my heart. And then when I was 34, I got a lucky break. I was at one of these uh, courses school uh, given by Dame Joan Sutherland and Maestro Bonning and an agent from London came Robert Gilder he came to the last uh, concert and he heard me and he offered to represent me he was willing to take a chance on me despite my lack of experience uh, but I also suspect he thought I was much younger than my age I've always looked younger than my age and it really really helped me in this business especially because I was starting so late he immediately sent me out uh, on an audition. And I could do a whole talk on auditions, but I'll tell you about this one because I learned two important mess, uh, lessons from it. It was for Opera North and they were casting Carmen. I arrived early and I was asked to wait in the corridor and I overheard the administrators talking, uh, saying, oh, we have so many applicants for this audition, just too, too many. Um, I just threw out everyone, all the resumes of anyone who was 30 years and older got thrown out. It's not fair, but it was the easiest solution. And I was sitting out there thinking, oh my God, <laughs> I'm 34. I'm so grateful to that agent in Graz who advised me always lie about your age. <laughs> that probably sounds strange to you because in North America, prospective employers aren't allowed to ask 
your age or your marital status or whether you have children. But in Europe at that time when I was there, those were all normal questions. And we were expected more times than not to write our birth dates on our resumes. So anyway, my, a couple of more years went by. Oh, wait, I forgot to tell you because <laughs> I called my agent after that. Uh, the, the next lesson came when I met the audition uh, panel. I'm sorry, I'm getting all tied up. Uh, and they asked me to introduce myself because my agent hadn't sent my resume and photo as is customary. And the first thing that came to my mind and the most important thing I had done was, uh, yeah, well, I sang in the Canadian Opera Company chorus for four years and I just heard this, oh, <laughs> so that was a bad thing to say. Uh, after the audition, I called my agent and uh, told him what happened. And he said, never, ever talk about your chorus work. And then he said he wondered how young singers are supposed to get any experience, which is another catch 22, right? Anyway, now I'll move on. Uh, another couple of years passed uh, before I got my next big break. I was in London singing a concert and I dropped in on my agent and he asked if I'd like to go to Regensburg, Germany to audition. They were looking for a house mezzo. And I thought, yeah, sure. I thought he'd send me in a week or two. Uh, and he said, splendid, I'll book your flight. You leave the day after tomorrow. So <laughs> I didn't have time to, to be scared and say no. I phoned Roberta immediately, of course, and asked her, what's Regensburg? And she said, oh, Maria, it's only one of the most beautiful cities in, in Germany. So. The plan was to fly out first thing in the morning to Munich, catch a train to Regensburg, it takes an hour and a half, sing my afternoon audition and then boot back to Munich for my return flight. So of course I missed my train. I arrived late. Uh, when I got to the theater, it was under construction and I couldn't find the audition hall. Luckily, I ran into one of the pianists there and he walked me the two blocks over to where the audition was being held because I never would have found it otherwise. I was given 10 minutes to warm up in the bathroom. I hadn't eaten for over seven hours and I was just so freaked out. I was so over it. I, I just wanted the audition to be over and done with and just get out of there. And I think that distracted me enough from my nerves that I sang really well. And a couple of months later, I learned that I had been hired for the job. So wanting a job too much kills an audition, I have to say. Um, and singers hate auditioning and, and we know the best way to treat an audition is like another performance, but there's always so much at stake, uh, all the time and money you've invested. And you really, really wanna get the job and more times than not, you don't. But on this day, the stars aligned and I was hired to be a full-time opera singer in a German opera house. And now we start the pretty pictures. Here we go. Now this is beautiful Regensburg. Uh, I, I, honestly, I felt like I was living on an opera set come to life. And I could do a whole presentation on the city of Regensburg, but um, I just don't have time. <laughs> there it is, aerial view. Uh, I was an employee of the city with health insurance, vacation pay, a pension, just like any other city employee. And the town was small enough that people would recognize me on the street. And in fact, all the artists in the theater were valued members of the community. There's our beautiful opera house. Um, so German opera houses uh, use the repertory system, which is where they maintain a permanent ensemble and they rotate uh, productions over months or maybe years. Uh, in contrast, here in North America, we use the stagione or, or seasonal system. So each opera is cast individually and it'll have a short but intense run. So what that means, imagine you're singing four or five roles uh, in different operas and they're running all season long. Um, you need to keep all the roles straight in your mind, the music, the text, the staging. And if you're double cast, sometimes you'll be performing the same role 15 to 30 times, which actually is a wonderful opportunity to develop your character. Uh, it's something 
you don't get to do when you sing a role maybe three or four times. There's our beautiful theater from the inside. Yeah, it's pretty, huh? Mm -hmm. And on nights when you're not performing, you're often in rehearsal for another show. So it's a real full-time job and I loved it. So to help singers keep all the different roles they're singing <laughs> straight in their head, uh, opera, uh, the German opera houses uh, have prompters called souffleurs. And in Regensburg, our souffleur would be behind the wing here. So we could just you know, look over if we needed a prompt. But the larger theaters uh, have a prompter's box. And I'd love to show you this because I just think, I think it's really interesting. So here you can see this very grateful singer <laughs> shaking the hand of the prompter there. Uh, the prompter will sit right under the stage there. So just their head sticking up and they have a copy of the score, which is the music. And they need to know the opera just as well as the conductor so that they can give cues whenever they're needed. Well, I'm proud to say I never needed a prompter and our souffleur knew they could always relax when I was on stage. So here's another view of our beautiful theater. That's uh, the Royal Box. Uh, most theaters in Europe have a Royal Box. It's where the kings and queens and such would sit. We do have a princess in Regensburg, a princess von Thun und Taxis. And no, she never came to any of our performances. Uh, there's the view from the Royal Box. Our ensemble was a mix of Germans, Americans, Canadians, South Africans. Uh, working with the same singers over many productions gave us a chance to develop a deep understanding for each other. And we played off each other and supported each other. It was the most wonderful of musical families. And there's some pictures of our productions there. I got to sing many of the major mezzo-soprano roles, uh, also Mahler songs with orchestra, chamber music, uh, and song recitals. I'll, I'll just whip th through these quickly. That's uh, Werther, Charlotte, uh, Maddalena, and Rigoletto, uh, Hansel and Gretel, I was Hansel. Uh, back here is Bradamante in uh, Alcina. This is um, an opera that's not done much. Uh, von Weber's Oberon, and we, uh, opened the newly renovated opera house with this because it used singers, actors, and the ballet. So the whole company was involved. Um, that's Cherubino down there from Marriage of Figaro. And this is Dora Bella in Quasi Fantute, one of my favorite roles. Unfortunately, this all came to an end three years later. Our general manager retired. The new general manager appointed by the mayor laid off most of the soloists and brought his favorite singers from his previous theater with him to replace us. This is typical of a change of general manager in German theaters. And I should mention also that uh, many singers advance through the system this way nowadays. And German theaters are categorized on A, B, C, or D. And that's not to do with the quality, it's to do with the size of the orchestra. So a D house um, has a smaller orchestra. Um, so they won't be able to do Wagner and Verdi shows. Regensburg was a B house. Uh, so imagine, you know, if you make friends or are liked by a general manager who's very ambitious, he'll work his way up the ladder in this system and he'll take you along with him and you never have to audition and you make your career. Unfortunately, this wasn't an option for us in Regensburg because our general manager had retired. Some of my colleagues went on to find work in another theater. Uh, some of them gave up singing altogether. My North American friends had to leave Germany, but because I had a Greek passport, I could stay. I did try to find another permanent position, but was unsuccessful. Instead, I started freelancing which meant a lot of traveling and living out of a suitcase. Yeah. My freelance work took me from singing in opulent 2000 seat opera houses to singing in pubs and box theaters. And that first post Regensburg gig was uh, the pub gig. It was a 90 minute version of Rossini's Barber of Seville, one of the off main stage shows offered by the Wexford Festival. I had less than two weeks to learn the role of Rosina and fly to Ireland to replace someone who had canceled at the last minute. 
my agent told me I'd be singing in a pub, but I imagined it to be one of those, uh, you know, former bar turned intimate performance venue things. But when I arrived for the first rehearsal, I saw it, it really was a pub, like a working pub that had been open the night before because there was a stench of cigarettes in the air, half beer glasses, the floor was sticky. It was just gross. <laughs> And the director asked us not to touch anything and things were cleaned up in a couple of days. Um, there were quite a few Italian singers at this festival and some of them were staying in the same residence where I was staying, which was attached to a pub, of course. We all had our own bedrooms, but we shared a kitchen area and the Italians insisted that we all cook and eat dinner together, which was quite wonderful, actually. And uh, they came well prepared for their seven week stay in the wilds of Ireland. They brought with them olive oil, Parmesan cheese, pasta, coffee, and an espresso maker. So I learned from them. And when I started going on the road, I also traveled with my little care kit. I had my coffee maker, a sharp knife and a clean cutting board because you never knew what you'd find in some of these hotel apartment kitchens. Now, the Box Theater uh, was one of the plainest theaters I've ever sung in, but in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Venice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty nice. Uh, I was the only non-native French speaker in this opera, in this cast, and there was a lot of French dialogue, <coughs> and that was incredibly challenging for me. I found out later from the composer's wife that the reason I got the role was because I had memorized the aria from the opera for the audition. And the composer who was on the audition panel was so touched that I had made the extra effort that he chose me over all the others. So sometimes it's a little unexpected, who knows what, that'll get you the job. Uh, my first uh, contract in France was for the Angers Nantes Opera. Uh, in one of the most difficult mezzo roles in the repertoire, Adal Giza in Bellini's Norma. And I was hired for that by a director who had worked with me in Regensburg uh, on another very difficult role, a composer in Ariadne of Naxos. So this is two theaters, Angers and Nantes, uh, two separate cities, but they share the productions. Uh, I, there's the interior, this is in Angers. I sang, uh, aside from Adal Giza, I sang Mrs. Groves in Britain's Turn of the Screw, and I sang Antonia's Mother from Tales of Hoffman. And this is the uh, front of the, the opera in Nantes, very beautiful opera house, very different on the inside with the cool blue. So, in France, I'd like to show you L'Opéra de Metz. Now, this is France's oldest working opera house and one of the oldest in Europe. I sang three productions there. Um, I sang Neris in Cherubini's Médée. In the original French, you may recognize the opera as Médéa. Uh, I also sang Tales of Hoffman again, but this time Niklaus. And I sang a couple of songs in a ballet version of Theodorakis Zorba the Greek. Uh, there's some interior. So this table, this is what you'll see when we're in production. Uh, the stage director and the lighting designer and costume designers, everyone who's in the production will sit there and watch what's going on on stage. Okay. And that's the view from the dressing room in the back. It's just a beautiful city. The Medei uh, production was reprised in, uh, for one performance in Nîmes, uh, dubbed the most Roman city outside of Rome. And uh, performing in this amphitheater really gave this uh, a wonderful atmosphere because it's, it's a mythological story. It was August uh, in the south of France, so we couldn't start rehearsing until nine o'clock at night and we'd go till midnight because it was just too hot during the day. Uh, and this, um, if you can imagine, half of it was blocked off. They put up a stage and there was the orchestra in front of that, and then they had seating for the public here. 
Now, uh, this contract sticks out in my mind because I witnessed some backstage intrigue that I want to share with you. The tenor uh, in the Mets production had a really hard time singing the difficult role of Jason. So another tenor was hired for this production in Nîmes. And one day before our first rehearsal, this guy canceled. And because this opera is so rarely performed, they had no choice but to ask the original tenor to come and sing. And he knew what was going on and he, he showed up with a very bad attitude. I can't blame him on some level. Well, after the performance, we all took our bows. Uh, the smaller roles come out first. Uh, I followed a couple of chorus ladies. Um, my role was small, but I had a very beautiful aria to sing. And we were politely applauded. And then as the big role soloists took their bows, uh, this chorus of boos rose from the crowd. Uh, and then when the tenor walked out, the boos changed to bravos. So backstage, oh my God, the baritone was so angry. He accused the tenor of hiring a clack and they almost came to blows drama on and off stage, right? <laughs> so a clack is a group of people paid by a singer to boo certain singers and applaud others, usually oh. the one putting the bill. Now, I don't think that's ever happened in Canada, but I understand that still goes on at La Scala. Through my work at Metz, I was invited to sing Third Lady in Mozart's Magic Flute at Théâtre du Châtelet in Paris. I was just thrilled to be there and I had enough free time to explore the city and uh, visit with friends who live there. Oh, someone hasn't muted, if you don't mind muting yourself because it keeps <laughs> distracting me when I hear noises. Um, anyway, this is a huge theater and they use it mostly for musicals and touring productions. And there's another view of it. Now, again, through my work uh, in Metz, I was invited to sing Dryad in Ariadne of Naxos at Opera of Monte Carlo. The theater is attached to the casino and I really regret not visiting it while I was there. Uh, the theater itself is called Salle Garnier, uh, named after the designer of the beautiful Paris Opera House. And this theater is in fact an exact miniature replica of that house. And uh, this is the artist entrance. This is the back of the theater, which is also very beautiful. And there's the front. Because Monte Carlo was too expensive for us freelance artists, uh, the singers stayed in neighboring Beausoleil, which was just over the border in France, uh, about a 10 minute walk to the theater. Uh, so this was my walk to work. The production was gorgeous. I'm sorry, I don't have pictures to show you, but it had sumptuous costumes and expensive props like the real Waterford crystal, uh, sterling silver flatware and bone china for the two minute dinner scene. And I'd love to tell you that my fee was as opulent, but I think most of the budget went to the set and costumes. There's some interior, another royal box. No, the Prince of Monaco didn't come to see the show. <laughs> but I, anytime I had a chance, uh, I would sit in here and, and watch the rehearsal and just bask in this beautiful, beautiful atmosphere. So I also sang in Toulon and Nice in the south of France um, in a different production of the ballet Zorba. Again, this came from my work in Metz um, because connections are really everything in this business. I sang a New Year's Eve uh, performance at, in Toulon and I was invited by the music critic uh, to her home to celebrate afterwards. How nice is that? And she also gave me a very nice review. <laughs> and being in France, you can imagine how amazing the cheese and the champagne was. And there's an inter uh, interior. It's a big house too. Another detail. Uh, this is a foyer and where you go and have your glass of champagne at intermission and they, they give little recitals from the stage. And that's the front of uh, Nice.
another royal box. And that's what you'd be seeing if you were in the royal box. It's beautiful. And uh, you walk out of the theater and you have this beautiful view. Now, I performed once with a touring company in the Netherlands. Opera Zaud invited me to sing The Evil Stepmother in Massenet Cendrillon. And you can find that entire performance on YouTube. Um, and uh, you can follow along with the uh, Dutch um, <laughs> translation on the bottom, practice your Dutch. Uh, so this company is based in Maastricht, as you can see. And uh, we rehearsed there and performed two shows. And the rest of the performances were runouts uh, because it's a small country. We would drive out uh, to whichever city was hosting us that evening, do a quick stage check, grab a bite to eat, perform, and then load onto the bus and return to Maastricht, arriving back after midnight. We'd have the next day off to recover, and then we'd set out again the following day. Uh, we gave four performances, then we had two weeks off, and then we had four more shows. And the company was nice enough to lend me a bicycle for my 10 week stay there. So I really felt like I was living the Dutch life while I was there. There's the front of the theater in Maastricht, their home house. And it is a modern theater, uh, something we're used to seeing us here. And that's the view from the stage. I'd like to tell you about a couple of summer opera festivals I participated in. Uh, this is Rossini in Bad Wildbad in the Black Forest, and it specializes in lesser known operas by Rossini and his contemporaries. Bad Wildbad is a spa town and Rossini stayed there in 1856 to take the waters and apparently that invigorated him enough that he started composing again after a 25 year hiatus. This festival was founded in 1989. And look how beautiful. It's really in the middle of the forest. I sang two roles there, Argene in Ciro in Babylonia and Madame la Rose in uh, La Gazzetta. And I'll just tell you two fun stories about that. When Rossini was writing uh, Ciro in Babylonia, the singer who was singing the role I sang, Argene, he just thought she was really ugly and she had a really ugly voice. And the only note that she had that was nice was the B flat above middle C. So he wrote her an entire aria on one note. And yeah, she was annoyed by that <laughs> at first, but she had a huge success with it. So in the end, it was a good thing. And I got played on German radio singing that aria because it's such an oddity. And uh, the other opera, La Gazzetta, features a character who only speaks Neapolitan and we had a wonderful singer from Napoli to fill that role. Now, oh, I forgot about that picture. It's a beautifully detailed, tiny, sweet little theater. Now, I sang my dream role, Carmen, at the Longborough Festival Opera. It's a privately owned opera house. Those things do exist in England. <laughs> and it's located on the grounds of founders Martin and Lizzie Graham's home in the Cotswolds. It's uh, like Gauleinborn Festival, there's another view. Oh, I should point out, uh, that's Wagner, Verdi, and Mozart, our important uh, opera composers. So like Gauleinborn Festival, uh, it features a long dinner interval where the spectator can enjoy a picnic out on the beautiful grounds and socialize. Uh, that's the aerial view of our beautiful theater. I don't know if you can see here, that's the Grahams live in this gorgeous house here. That's their guest home. And uh, I just have a couple of fun facts about this theater. Uh, it's a 500 seat little theater and it started life as a chicken coop. And you can see it has this aluminum siding roof, kind of gives you a hint of what it used to be. And these lush red seats were salvaged from the Royal Opera House Covent Garden after that theater's renovation in 1999. So I'll just go back to this view. Uh, back to the Grahams. They are Wagner fanatics and the main purpose of creating this theater was to stage full productions of Wagner operas. And even in this small theater, they have built 
an orchestra pit modeled after Wagner's own theater in Bayreuth, accommodating 72 players. And to finance this dream, aside from donors' uh, help, the festival stages more popular operas like Carmen, Don Giovanni, Merit of Figaro, things like that. And I understand that Martin never attends any of those performances. He's just not interested if it's not Wagner. And I guess that's the kind of passion you need to build your own opera house. So uh, yeah, my time as a freelance singer in Europe was exciting, but life on the road can be tough too. The career is about much more than, than just the singing. You need to be okay with being alone a lot, traveling alone, eating in restaurants alone. And while you're in rehearsal, it's a lot of fun. And while you're performing, it's wonderful. But when you're alone in your hotel room after a show in a town where you don't know anyone far from family and friends who can't be there to share in your successes or comfort you when things don't go as well as you had hoped, you realize that not everything about opera is glamorous. And you need to be okay with a lot of uncertainty uh, and dealing with a lot of rejection. Because if you're not one of those lucky singers to be working uh, in a German opera house where you have job security, you have to always put yourself out there auditioning, traveling, maintaining contacts. It's a lot of work. And a sniffle or a sore throat will just send a singer into a tailspin of worry and dread. Because if you don't sing, you don't get paid. And sometimes the show doesn't go on. So having said all of that, <laughs> when you're on stage, it's the most wonderful feeling. Uh, it's completely worth all the trouble you've gone through, in my humble opinion. But as I entered my 40s, uh, the offers were coming less frequently. And my husband of 12 years passed away. And I found myself at a personal and professional crossroad. I started reassessing my future in opera and in Germany. My parents weren't getting any younger and I really missed my sister back in Toronto. So was it time to go back? I didn't know. And I was still considering when I went to this party that Alita talked about uh, on one of my visits home and I met this handsome, quirky, intelligent guy. Uh, that was me. Yeah, it was you, yeah. And after a whirlwind courtship, he proposed. And uh, that kind of gave me the nudge that I needed to make my decision. Uh, now that I'm in Canada, with the help of my Canadian agent, Kathy Domini, I've had the pleasure of singing with Tapestry Opera, Against the Grain Theatre, and in three productions with Pacific Opera Victoria. And uh, in fact, I was invited to go for a fourth. I was supposed to be one of the Valkyries in September 2020, but we all know what happened then. I'm hoping that they'll have a chance to present that again in the future. And aside from that, I've sung with various orchestras and choral groups, and I love performing song recitals and chamber music with my musician friends in smaller, more intimate venues, like you can see here, Haliconian Hall. I still take lessons with Neil on occasion uh, to keep myself in shape. And I'm still hungry to make music and connect with audiences. Preparing this presentation for you uh, was a nice way to reflect on how many wonderful opportunities I've had. I've been so lucky. And uh, I'm really happy to be part of this beautiful, beautiful art form that is opera. So thank you very much uh, for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> you can unmute now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I went on long, didn't I? I'm sorry. I know you like to leave time for questions. I hope I've, I've allowed that. We still have time for questions. We still have time for questions. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to ask uh, Maria? Uh, yes. Jan, Gary? You need to unmute. Uh, okay. Where are we here? Are we on oh, Gary, we can no, hear. We're good. Are, are we unmuted? Yes, you are. Yeah, you're unmuted. Okay, good. Maria, fabulous, yes. fabulous presentation. And oh, thank I'm, you. I'm, 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 I'm blown away with your your recall of 
dates and 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 the number of times that you got kicked in the teeth and you still said, hey, I'm still going to get back up and keep going. So way to go. You go, girl. Thank you. I have to say, sometimes it's the last person standing who gets <laughs> the okay. job, right? Right. Anyone else? Mary and Jan, did you have a question? Yeah, I just want to know if Maria still plays the piano. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you about the piano. You know, when I got into U of T, um, I, I, had, I was a very accomplished pianist. Mm -hmm. That's how I got in. Uh, but my teacher wasn't part of that faculty, so I had to switch teachers. And the teacher I was with <coughs> wanted to change everything about the way I was playing. When you're at that advanced level, it was just really <coughs> difficult. Um, and then it, it just coincided with me starting to love singing more. And, and that's why I stopped playing. Uh, but now, yes, I've started playing piano again. It's important to me <clears throat> to play. I love playing the piano. I'm not nearly as good a player as I was back then, but I'm, I'm chipping away at it. <laughs> I am. Do you play? No, not at all. It's just that when you've got two guests, you know, you really focused on, on um, expanding one gift. And yet, if you could get through all the conservatory exams and and then go be accepted, that's another gift as well. It, it must have been hard. Yeah, no, thank you. You know what, playing, I loved playing the piano and my mother would beg me to stop practicing. <laughs> she thought, you're a teenager, you should be out there having fun. It's like, no, 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 I, I loved it. I mean, I was a very good pianist, but I don't think, you know, I didn't have the talent to be a soloist. Uh, how, how many pianos do you oh, have? Oh, okay, <laughs> my husband. <laughs> Uh, so when I moved back to Toronto, um, Eric bought me a piano because uh, I was here for the summer and I didn't have a piano and I actually had a workshop. I was, um, sorry, it wasn't a workshop. I was uh, doing an opera and I needed a piano to learn my parts. So he bought me a piano. And then when I moved back from Germany, I brought my piano with me. And then eventually a friend of ours who owns a Steinway concert brand, uh, needed Yamaha, to sell it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The Yamaha concert grand. Sorry. She needed to sell her piano. We were housing it for her because she lived in an apartment. And so we ended up with this, uh, Yamaha concert grand. So I have three pianos, so I better be good at playing them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Alita? I mean, so you, uh, one time you told me that as you're singing, you do not have any, um, you don't use a microphone. And you explained to me how you project your voice. And I found that so very interesting. Okay. So, um, I mean, you're singing in Europe. You, you saw the opera houses I showed you, right? Um, the orchestra is under the stage. They, they're not at the same level as you. So... Um, their sound is covered a little bit. Um, it won't be as present. And uh, also there is a wonderful acoustic built into the building. They take care with that. And a singer, why I sing or the way I sing opera and I don't sound like a folk singer or I have to tell you, I love untrained voices and I really love untrained voices and folk singers. And, but I can't sound like that. I've trained my voice too much because we're trained uh, to get that singer's formant. It's a frequency that does not exist in any orchestral instrument. And that's what makes our voices carry over an orchestra. I mean, if you have all the brass and strings and everyone playing at full blast, it, it'll be hard. You need to have balance too. That's what the conductor's ear is for. He has to balance. And a good opera composer will write <laughs> full orchestra parts when the singer's not singing. And, you know, when a singer has a high note, the orchestra can come up more. And when you're singing in your lower range, the orchestra, <laughs> Should, the, the writing should be softer. So all these things come into play, but yeah, it's, it's that frequency that we're trained to achieve. Is that what I told you that time? I think so, yes, yes, okay. yes, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? How, how many of you go to the opera or like opera? I'm just curious. Maria, it's Diane here. Um, I like anything cl classical music, opera, um, I was just wondering, are there any uh, theaters in Toronto that have excellent acoustics? 
Well, the Canadian Opera Company, the new house is very good. So when I was in the chorus, we were in the O'Keeffe Center, it was back then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, stick to speak of. So we were, they actually had mics just for, not to um, amplify us, but to give an acoustic into the house. Oh. Yeah, because that, that hall is built for big shows um, and microphones. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, I mean, musical singers, they're singing against a different instrumentation and they have a different technique. Um, belting, it sounds loud, but my teacher teaches a lot of belters and he has a lot of singers on Broadway and I've watched him work with the Broadway singers. And if you scream, you're gonna blow your chords out. You, you can't do that. It, it's, um, so they have the microphones, the, the musical singers, it's almost like talking. It's a very different technique. So um, mm. yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm digressing from your que question. Yeah. Uh, I'd say I've sung, you know, the, the Pacific Opera Victoria Theater <laughs> is, is really good. They have a beautiful acoustic, um, but those are the only theaters I've not sung in the current uh, opera company theater. At the Canadian Opera Company um, Theatre. I was wondering about, excuse me, I was just wondering about Massey Hall. Mm -hmm. Oh, Massey Hall. Um, well, you know what? I, I only sang there when I was in Tafel Music. We did Messiah, and I think it was good. Uh, I don't remember <coughs> us having any issues with it. Um, and they've renovated and now, so I'm sure they've improved everything in there. So, yeah. Well, Massey Hall, yeah, it probably was built for acoustic. It's an old I think hall. Massey Hall, I think when they built Massey Hall, um, they built it with Handel's Messiah in mind. Yeah. So, and so that yeah. if you hear Handel's Messiah, and I, I was fortunate enough to go at one point, it, it, the acoustics were just phenomenal for it. Oh, okay, I just learned something. Mm -hmm. but, but it is an older theater, so they would have had acoustic uh, performances in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very, very much. It was a very, very interesting evening. Thank oh, you're most welcome. Alita, did you want to... Uh, now, don't people yeah. leave. We're going to have our Wheel of Fortune in a minute. So Okay. Alita. Well, I just... Maria, my, my sweet cousin, I just want to thank you so much. You, you, uh, you are uh, just amazing. And um, I can't get over the experiences you've had in the, your lifetime i'm so glad that you're part of our family and um i'm really hoping that when the bob cajun music council gets back into our uh, performances that maybe you, know, you can join us here and and we can hear you and um eric thanks so much for bringing maria into our family and um you, you're just wonderful thank you so much we really enjoyed thank this tonight thank you thank you thank you so uh, do you want me to stick around or do you want me to leave? What happens? You can, you can stick around you if you stick want to around. around in case someone, you know, we have a little yeah. conversation afterwards. Nice yeah. to see you from the go. Air, proper horizon. <laughs> she's a great speaker, isn't she? Yeah, she's amazing. Oh, um, I know, I know. Don't ever give up your music career, but you could have a good career in public speaking. Oh, thank you. Can I confess something? This is really difficult for me. And honestly, I went into singing so I wouldn't have to talk. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> and this has been way outside of my comfort zone. I've, I've given this talk only once before and um, I, I'm really happy, you know, it, it's challenging, but I'm glad it comes off as effortless. It's very it good. is. And I saw that I saw your original one and this was just as good, if not better. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So Mike, would you like to take it away? <clears throat> Yeah, I guess it's uh, my time to shine now. Uh, it's the door prize time. Uh, tonight we have a really special door prize for those full members who are in attendance. Uh, Terry was able to track down and order a, a two CD set of the Italian libretto Ciro in Babylonia by Rossini. Our guest speaker tonight, uh, she made reference to being in this town, Vilbad, but uh, she sang the role of uh, Argene in this production that was recorded live in Germany during the Rossini in Vilbad Festival 2004. So I wish all of the members whose names should be on the wheel uh, good luck. And I will remember now to share my screen and here we go. 
Yep. And I will get rid of this. <coughs> and here we go. <clears throat> it looks like oh, Jan. Oh, just Jan this. Crowder has <laughs> picked up the two CD set of Sino and Babylonia. Are you okay? Congratulations <laughs> and thank you all for joining us here tonight. Thanks, Boyle. Okay, so I, I guess, um, are you still, I have to go into the gallery view again. <coughs> I'm going to stop the recording now.